Lately, I've been feeling like I don't quite belong, caught somewhere in that void between caster and collector. I can't imagine buying a vintage or discontinued lore and not actually fishing it. Yet every time I cast a piece of old school gold over the rail, I am filled with dread that I'm going to lose it. So today on Retro Bassin, we have a solution. I've dug back through the old treasure chest and found a dozen discontinued lures from various manufacturers that I think deserve a reissue today. And lucky for us, every one of these designs is currently owned by Pradco. So if anybody out there in Fort Smith, Arkansas is listening, do a retro a favor and let's get these classics back on the market ASAP. Now, before we get started, I will say there is nothing scientific or formulaic about today's list. It is my show and it's my list. But I have no doubt that many of you guys have your own Pradco creations that you would like to see reissued today. So please, by all means, drop a comment down below and let the folks at Pradco know what old school baits you want to see get a new school look. But for now, let's get on with Retro's reissue wish list. Recently got to spend a few days with George Buddy Perrin, son of the late George Perrin, who of course founded Rebel Lures. Well, it should come as no surprise then that first on my list of reissue requests is a lure from Rebel. There will actually be two Rebel Lures on this list, uh, but the first is a crankbait that I have not seen on the shelf in quite a few years. When Buddy and I got together, of course, the subject invariably went to crankbaits, one of my favorite lures. And it was interesting to see that Buddy and I actually have two different favorites when it comes to Rebel cranks. Buddy's all-time favorite is the Rebel Humpback where I've always been partial to the Rebel We Are. When Perrin sold Plastics Research to EBSCO in 1980, the Rebel Lore catalog was bursting at the seams, both with topwaters, crankbaits, and even a soft plastic worm. Over time, the Rebel Lore lineup narrowed, but crankbaits like these two remained in prominence in the Bass Pro Shops Master Catalog until at least 1999. But sometime after Y2K, the lineup got even narrower and the larger offerings of the Rebel We Are disappeared from production. Today, the only Rebel We Are still available for purchase is this, the smallest version, the eighth ounce Teeny We Are. And while I like this bait a whole lot, there is no doubt to me that that classic two inch the F93 We Are and also the F93 Deep We Are would be both great sellers and also great fish catchers. In fact, I would venture to say those two classic crankbaits are probably just as effective today as they were when George Perrin Sr. first invented them. These days, Bill Norman is primarily known for their crankbait offerings. In particular, those painted by Frank Scalish, just like this one I picked up from the LoreNet website. But I chose a discontinued topwater for the entry on this list. A cross between a topwater frog and a buzzbait, the Weed Walker hit both the shelves and the lily pads in the late 1990s. I remember reading a story of how this particular lure was invented and when I do find that, I'm hoping I find it one day, I will definitely do a history of the Bill Norman Weed Walker. But until then, I have just a few of these Weed Walkers in my personal collection and since you can only imagine the kind of place you throw a bait like this, I am always cautious every time I chunk one of these over the rail. The Weed Walker remained in the Bass Pro Shops Master Catalog at least as far as 1997. However, I imagine it's probably been a couple decades since any bass has heard this thing buzzing overhead. <sighs> I 
The Lazy Ike was first produced and marketed by Kutsky Sporting Goods in Fort Dodge, Iowa by an Australian immigrant by the name of Joseph Kutsky. The original lure was carved from a Fort Dodge fisherman by the name of Newell Daniels in the mid-1930s and it remained a multi-species favorite for over 60 years until the Lazy Ike Corporation was purchased by EBSCO or Pradco in 1991. Here's a Lazy Ike that I've got in the package and yeah this is one of the all-time classics for not only bass but also pike and walleye. Taking a look at the bait it looks a whole lot like a flat fish. It's got sort of that built-in bill and a line tie that is actually pretty far anterior on the nose of the bait. It is a nice shallow diving wiggling bait and man I have caught just about every fish under the sun on this red and white Lazy Ike. The Lazy Ike was available for sale in the 1988 Bass Pro Shops Master Catalog and even had a half page spread in this the 1998 Pradco Power Brands Catalog. Here is the spread and you can see about half the page is dedicated to Creek Chub and the other half to the lone lure offered from Lazy Ike in 1998, the Lazy Ike. But it seems to happen all too often. This once iconic lure fell out of favor with anglers and the only lure still bearing the Lazy Ike name was eventually discontinued. While the Lazy Ike Corporation had a number of other interesting offerings, including this line of crankbaits called Natural Ike that I would love to see back in production, I will keep my ask to Pradco simple. Just go ahead and reissue two baits for Old Retro, the Lazy Ike 2 and the Lazy Ike 3 in the classic red and white. In 1947, Jack K. Smithwick founded Smithwick Lures in Shreveport, Louisiana, and Jack and his son, Jack A. Smithwick, offered a pretty incredible line of wooden body lures with some fanciful names like the Gandy Dancer, the Water Gator, the Buck and Ball, and the Jingle Bob. Smithwick sold to Pradco in 1992, and the product line continued to focus on two of the most popular styles of Smithwick the Devil's Horse, and the Rattling Rogue. Now my Smithwick reissue wish list could fill up an Umco 3500 tackle box, but for the sake of this video, I will put out one small request. Just bring back the Devil's Toothpick. This little three and a half inch stick bait from the 1940s has already been reissued once in 1998, and it is, in my opinion, to the Zara Spook what the Devil's Horse is to the Wood Chopper, a much more subtle version of basically the same style bait. Now, I don't currently have any Devil's Toothpicks in my collection, but I do have this bait, which is a pretty close relative slash reproduction. This is a frog skin chew pick from my friend Michael Bacon over at Bacon's Tackle. He makes these custom, and if you're in the shop, uh, he will sell them to you. And boy, this is such a cool little bait. I would so love to see this reissued from Pradco. Before he sold his company to Evsco in 1980, Cotton Cordell was producing over 2,200 lures a day and employed over 200 employees, both in Hot Springs, Arkansas and abroad. In my opinion, Cotton Cordell was one of the most inventive lure makers of all time. And in addition to contributions that most of us know about, like the plastic Big O, the Gay Blade, and the Redfin, he also had some lesser realized contributions to bass fishing lures, including the invention of the safety pin style spinnerbait. While the Cotton Cordell Super Spot is still available for sale today, there are two different variations that I personally would love to see back in production. And since I found both on the same page of a Bass Pro Shops Master Catalog, I felt justified to making this one a double entry. The first bait I would like to see in production is the top one, a suspending super spot. 
This is a really cool bait and a presentation that I don't think the bass see too, too often. I remember when the lipless crankbait craze came out, there were some other variations you would see like the diving rattle traps spots as well as the floating versions. I always loved the suspending version, however, and I felt like it fished sort of like a smaller version of a jerkbait. And below that is a smaller version of a, another pretty cool spot, the rattle spot minnow. What I love about both of these spots is that they give the fish a different look on a traditional lipless crankbait and probably a few presentations that they haven't seen in quite a while. Well, the next lure is one of the oldest on the list. First introduced in wood in 1929 and later a plastic spook edition in the 1940s. Of course, I'm talking about the classic Hedden River Runt. Now, while my time on the water with this bait is pretty limited, my buddy Terry Battisti over at the Bass Fishing Archives says he has a special place in his heart for this lure because he caught his first ever bass on a river runt just like this. Believe it or not, the river runt was still in production into the late 1980s, even if the lure only had a modest three lure spread in the 1988 Bass Pro Shops Master Catalog. Traveling to both regional and national antique tackle shows, I can tell you that the Head and River Runt is one of the most popular lures with collectors today, even if most have never actually fished the bait. I'm not sure what finally banished the River Runt to the land of discontinued lures, but one has to wonder if its unusual profile just couldn't compete with the popular shallow water alphabet style crankbaits of the day. Either way, I wish that Hedden would adopt this runt of the litter one more time. Before we move on to the next lure on the list, I do want to pause to remind everybody to go check out RetroBassinTackle.com. We very recently got the website up and running again. So if you're looking for some more retro bassin merch like shirts, hats, and stickers, as well as logo lures, or perhaps some Japanese lures that are not really available in the United States, head on over to RetroBassinTackle.com. I pretty much box up every order myself, so let me know if there is something specific, maybe on this lure wall, that you would like to look at. The Rebel Ultralights were truly a groundbreaking line of micro artificials back when the light tackle ultralight phase was really in full swing in the late 1980s, early 1990s. New in 1991, the Caterpillar is definitely the smallest entry in this list, checking in at just one and three quarters of an inch and five sixty-fourths of an ounce. What a weird measurement. <laughs> Anyway, this lure is very unique in the way that it was designed to be fished. First off, this is a sinking bait. And the recommended technique is to cast the catacrawler out near shallow cover and let it slowly sink. Sort of like a bug or a grub that just fell from a tree. When it gets down to the desired depth, give it a gentle twitch. And hopefully that will convert any followers into biters. This is one of the first ultralight baits that I remember throwing for panfish as a kid. Although I'm not sure why some rebel lures like the Crick Hopper, the Wee Frog, and the Helgramite remain in the line, while others like the Big Ant, the Creek Creature, and the Catacrawler disappeared. But I, for one, would love to see Pradco dig up this little worm. Well... <laughs> It looks like my prayers might have just been answered by Pradco on this one. I was recently texting with Patrick Marbury, who is the brand manager for Rebel Lures, and I mentioned to him that, boy, I would love to see a Caterpillar back in production. Well, Patrick responded with a photo of a limited-run Caterpillar that will be available on the LureNet website later this year. While the name Whopper Sopper may draw blank stares from younger anglers, there was a time when lures like these dominated the southern fishing scene. 
There is a great 1970 Whopper Stopper catalog available over at Bass Fishing Archives for your viewing pleasure. And boy, just take one glance at that and you can see that this company totally produced some old school gold. We're talking baits like the Hellbender, the Bayou Boogie, and one of my favorites, the Whirlybird. While its chief regional competitor was the Bomber Lure Company, Whopper Stopper's designs were uniquely their own. Case in point, one of my favorites, the Throbber. Marketed as the lure with the beating heart, the Throbber features a lead split shot attached to a metal spring inside the bait. And whenever you twitch this lure, that spring quivers, causing the whole bait to vibrate like a wounded bait fish. What's interesting to me about Whopper Stopper ended up under the Pradco umbrella is that Hedden actually acquired Whopper Stopper back in 1983, just a few months before Hedden itself was acquired by Pradco. Thus might be the reason that some Hedden baits today, like the Hellbender and the Bayou Boogie, have the Hedden name and not the Whopper Stopper name. All that to say, I would personally love to see a version of this bait reissued. I don't care if they call it the Whopper Stopper Throbber or the Hedden Throbber, as long as they call it. Personally, I get so excited every time I crack open a Fred Arbogast lure like this and pull out the pocket catalog nestled inside. Fred's creations always have a special place in my heart and cast for cast, no other lure stirs up nostalgia quite like Arbogast. Now, Pratt co-acquired Arbogast in 1997 and while both the original and also the upgraded versions of the Jitterbug and the Hula Popper remain in the line today, man, this deep catalog has some really unique baits that truly deserve a second chance. Now, it could have easily included some classic Arbogast baits like the Stickleback, the Hawaiian Wiggler, or even the Mudbug on this list. But instead, I chose a much lesser known version of the Jitterbug that I think would not only be a blast today, but kind of reminds me of something you might see out of Japan. Talking about the Arbogast Jitterbug Jitter Stick. Well, maybe the reason for the Jitter Stick's inclusion on my list is that I actually don't currently have a Jitter Stick in my collection. I have been on the hunt for one to fish with, but just about everyone I see online is a a little bit too pricey for something I would tie to the end of a five foot six inch pistol grip rod and send on out there. But I can't help but think that this cross between a prop bait and a jitterbug would give a new generation of bass something that they've never ever seen before. I've had a chance to fish with this next lure rather extensively when I was back in Texas. And as much as I would like to keep this clear little bait a secret, well, I think that the Cotton Cordell near nothing would sell quite well and probably catch even better these days. Unlike just about every top water lure you've ever thrown, the near nothing is a sinking bait. Thanks to being made from solid plastic. Work quickly, the bait fishes a whole lot like a pop bar, but when you pause it, the near nothing slowly sinks down in the water column, drawing strikes from any followers. This neat little half ounce, two and a quarter inch bait was killer for schooling largemouth bass and white bass on Lake Travis. And man, every time I cast this thing, I was a little bit nervous that I would lose it because they go for about 20 or 30 bucks online. Available in a few colors into the late 1980s, this clear version of the bait is my go-to, which as that lure sinks down in clear water, it almost becomes like near nothing. This next request might be a bit of a pipe dream, but I just had to ask. On June 2nd of 1932, a 20-year-old farm boy by the name of George W. Perry forever changed bass fishing when he landed a world record 22-pound, four-ounce largemouth out of Montgomery Lake in southern Georgia. 
Now, for years, this catch has been shrouded in both mystery and also controversy, with historians unable to agree on the exact lore that caught that fish or if that fish was even a largemouth bass at all. I'm actually in the process of doing a History of episode on the catch as it's known, but in the meantime, let's talk about two Creek Chub lures I would love to see reissued. Now, when Perry entered his catch into the Field and Stream competition, he listed the lure that caught the fish as this, the Creek Chub Wigglefish. For years, this was accepted as fact, and Creek Chub actually featured this bait in a number of different advertisements, and also had a reissue of that record-catching lure. But fast forward a number of years, and an audio interview revealed that that world record-catching lure might not have been a wiggle fish, but rather a Creek Chub bait called the Fintail Shiner. Now, I can understand how somebody might confuse a Bomber 6A with a 7A, but in my opinion, these two baits could not look any different. One jointed, the other not. One comes with these leather fins, the other a metal fin. So I'm not exactly sure what went on back in the day when George W. Perry was talking about which lure he caught it on, but either way, there's a pretty good chance the lure that we always thought did it, didn't. And in fact, it is this one, the fin tail shiner. Well, at this point, nobody but George W. Perry knows, and he has since passed away. So why not, Pradco, reissue both of these potentially world record catching baits in a commemorative two-pack? For whatever reason, metal lip crankbaits just like this waned in popularity, which is really unfortunate because Pradco owns the rights to a number of different metal lip baits, including the Bomber, the Water Dog, and of course, the Arbogast Mud Bug. But if I could convince Pradco to bring back just one of the metal lip crankbaits, it would 100% be the original Bomber. And why not bring it back in the four, 500, and 600 sizes in some classic colors like this Christmas tree? The Gainesville, Texas-based company was eventually sold to Pradco, and in 1989, the Bass Pro Shops Master Catalog still had a pretty respectable spread dedicated to the original bomber. However, by 1992, the allure was relegated to a tiny piece of real estate in the striped bass section. Flipping through my vintage Bass Pro Shops lure catalogs in preparation for this video, it really became apparent that the late 80s, early 90s was a time for both innovation and discontinuation when it came to Pradco lures. But boy, it is amazing just how many lures back there that uh, have unfortunately not lasted the test of time, but I am convinced would not only be good sellers, but also good fish catchers today. So Pradco, uh, let's get on it guys. Just a short list of 12 lures that Old Retro wants to see. Um, I will wait for those to show up on the LoreNet website. And Bass and Buds, definitely let me know what Pradco baits I missed out on this list. I have no doubt there are dozens of discontinued pieces of old school gold that deserve a second lease on life. So go ahead and let me know what those are. Maybe we'll do a part two. In the meantime, if you guys are looking for some more old school content, you can click right here. Otherwise, I'll see you right back here, same time, same place. And until then, keep that carpet side up. And definitely, fish it old school. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bastards.